<laughs> right. Um, so I'll just talk about what I'm going to be talking about today. So for me, I'm a very, um, uh, I've got a very big connection with trees and I always have, and that sort of has spilled over into my practice. Um, certainly over the last few years, I've been really using a lot more um, medicines that comes from trees in particular. Um, and I am a passionate user of trees that are local um, to me, so um, UK. Um, and I'll be talking about that um, today. Um, but just to start off, um, anybody who's seen any of my materials, they'll know that I always have the same warning on everything. Do not take any herbs if you are pregnant, breastfeeding or taking any medication without checking a herbalist first. I will be talking about some trees. So I'll be talking about four trees today and some of those are not to be taken with medications and I'll be talking about that. But this is just for all. Blanket policy. Do not take anything if you are pregnant, breastfeeding or taking any medications without first checking it with a herbalist. There are interactions aplenty. And just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. Deadly nightshade is in the same family as potato. Okay. So, let me... Okay, so who am I? My name's Laura Carpenter and I'm a herbalist based in the UK. I run workshops, distant learning courses and all things herb related. I live in Somerset and have a small practice in Wellington. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to be covering in this session, which parts of trees are medicinal, and the four trees that I'm going to cover, because it's such a massive subject, I really wanted to focus this first introductory session on, on trees that people already probably know, um, just to help link that in with, rather than it being every single one as a tree that you, you know, you can't visualize, you don't know what it is. So those are the ones that I'm going to be covering. So we're going to be doing elder, horse chestnut, willow and ginkgo. Um, and this is a very brief introduction. It's just to whet your appetite about medicinal trees. We're not, I'm not going to be going into the massive depth. I mean, really, there, there are books and books and books that I could write about medicinal trees. So we're, we're only going to be here for <laughs> a short time. So I've really got to condense it down. Um, but you'll, you'll get the idea. Okay. Um, so this is what I'm going to be covering. So what I'm not going to be covering is how to identify trees, but I'm, I'm going to be putting a link at the end about um, a resource about identifying trees. A safe foraging and how to forage safely and appropriately. I'm not going to be cover covering that um, in this session. So if you are somebody who wants to go out and be collecting from trees, do make sure you're doing that safely and appropriately. Um, so find out that information before you do that. Um, and obviously, you need to be able to properly identify something before you do that. Um, and also, I'm not going to be going into the traditional and spiritual uses of trees in this session. Um, that is um, um, a huge topic, and I'm really going to be focusing on the real basics in this session rather than going into masses of depth. So I could have just picked one tree and tried to go into sort of a lot of depth on that tree, but I've decided to go a bit more broad and just more of an introduction. So just to put that out there. Um, so let's just pop in here. Okay. So which parts of trees are medicinal? And this is completely down to the individual tree. So it's not that every single, with every single medicinal tree, all of the leaves are medicinal. Uh, sadly, that's not the way that it works. So for example, leaves, ginkgo um, has, um, the, it's the leaves that are medicinal, but the seeds are poisonous. So that's not something that we'd be going near, but the, the leaves are medicinal. Um, and there are lots of examples of that where parts of the tree is poisonous and the other part is medicinal. Um, so leaves, yes, lots of the of medicinal trees, it's the leaf that is used. Um, also flowers, so lime flower is an example. 
um, and also elderflower, and I'm going to be talking about that. Fruits, so elderberry, for example, um, obviously there are, there are hundreds, but just to give you an example. Uh, nuts and seeds, um, or um, there are lots of those that are medicinal. Um, and the example being, of course, chestnut, or um, the, the seed being sometimes known as conker. Um, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, and also the bark can be medicinal. Um, and often traditionally the bark was used a lot more um, and we sort of the the modern use has sort of moved away from the bark in in some examples so an example of the bark would be cramp bark which is gelder rose um and i won't be talking about that one today because that one's a little bit more um advanced so that will be on a on a more follow-on session rather than an introductory one i'm going to be talking about today okay so the first one um is elder. Um, now, the species that I'm going to be talking about is Sambucus nigra, um, and this is um, the most common elder um, that you'll find in the UK. And the parts that are used is the young leaf, flowers, and berry. Um, it's widespread across the UK, it's not endangered in any way. Um, so there's no problem. Um, I mean, you do still need to be appropriate with your foraging in the how much is there and all of those things, but it isn't an endangered species in, in any way. It's very, um, it's very widespread um, and pretty easy to identify. Uh, okay. So it's herbal actions. So it's the leaf is external only and that's insect repelling, but this is, it has to be when the leaf is really young. Once the leaf starts to get past a certain point, which usually is the part where it begins to come into flower. So once it goes past that point, it becomes irritating and you don't want to be putting that in your insect repelling farms. Um, so, uh, so do make sure it's a young leaf if you're gonna, if you're gonna have a go with that. So the flower, I mean, there's hundreds of uses of elderflower. I've just put them down to just a few, just to um, sort of, start us off. It's anti-allergenic, it's anti catarrhal so that means it, it dries up mucous membranes, which is why it's really great for hay fever. Um, it's anti-inflammatory and it's diaphoretic, which means it helps to reduce fevers in a natural way. Um, and the berry has different actions again, and the berry is antiviral. Again, it has obviously lots, hundreds of actions, but I'm summarizing in my uh, presentation. Okay, so these, obviously when you get the presentation, these will be links, the little um, underlined blue bits um, will be a link to a recipe that I recommend. So um, don't need to worry about remembering websites or anything. Uh, so elderflower cordial, lots of people make that and there's lots of different recipes that you can try if you want to have a go. Obviously we're past, pretty much everybody is past the elderflower um, season now, we're into berries. And um, also, you know, you could, if you want to have a go at elderflower wine, um, sadly it loses its uh, medicinal properties once you start to get into that, um, that area, but it's still a fun one to uh, have, have a go with. So elderflower tea, it's a really great one that you can try for um, hay fever and elderflower does not have any interactions with any medication. So it's fine for anybody to have. Um, elderberry tincture, um, and that's a link to my video on tinctures, um, is a great preventative for, and also the treatment for colds and flus. Um, and it's a really, it's out now, so so definitely be out and, and gathering your berries. So a point to make about elderberry, when, if you eat um, a few elderberries fresh, it has an emetic effect, so it makes you sick. Um, now, this is caused by um, particular, particular biochemicals and what happens is if when you um, actually cook 
the elderberries that is break, broken down. So for those people who like to make jams or, you know, you want to be making your elderberry syrup or, um, you know, you want to make it into a, an apple and elderberry pie or, you know, all of these lovely things. As long as you cook it, you're breaking down those um, um, biochemicals and you, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't cause people to be to be sick. Um, do be a bit careful about the amount that you give because it can be a little bit laxative. Um, so it wouldn't be that I would maybe make a whole elderberry pie just on its own. Um, but um, it, it's as long as it's cooked, you don't have the, um, the issue with vomiting. So that is, it's a really important one to note because the elderberry, when you actually want to make it into a medicine, you're going to be needing to break that down because you're not going to want anybody to vomit from you giving them any kind of medicine. So there's a couple of different ways. You can make it into a syrup, like I've mentioned, and that would, that would break it down, boiling it up. You can freeze it. So if you what you want to do is you actually want to decoct it first. So that's boiling it up in a pan of water. That will break down all your, your skins and it will make it sort of pulpy. You can then strain that out um, and then you'll have a decoction. And that decoction you can then freeze. Um, and then you can just get out your concentrated decocted elderberry mixture from the freezer. Ice cube trays are great for this. Um, or lollies if you want to go that way. And, um, and then you've got a lovely antiviral um, remedy that you can just pop out of the freezer. So it's a really great, easy one and very, um, doesn't cost anything because it's just elderberries that you will have um, foraged. Um, and so I've mentioned tincture. So when you do have an elderberry and it's put into alcohol, that is another way of breaking down um, those, some of those biochemicals that that cause this um, people to be sick. So alcohol boiling um, is your are your two two options there to to stop that um, or cooking uh, the cooking process. Okay. Um, let's check my list. Okay. So. Horse chestnut. Now, I'm actually allergic to horse chestnut, so it's not one that I use, um, but I would love to use it if I were able to. Um, so horse chestnut, which is Aesculus hippocastrinum, in, um, that's its Latin name, and it's the seed that's used medicinally. Now, traditionally, I think the leaf was used a lot more, but um, now it tends to be more just the seed. Um, so do not eat the seeds. The seeds are irritating and poisonous. Do not eat them. <laughs> they are, you can make things with them, but it's external. So it's not to be, it's not an internal one that I'm going to be recommending. Um, so horse chestnut, it was introduced to the UK from Turkey in the late 16th century and widely planted, but it's not, it doesn't tend to be found in woodlands unless somebody has planted them in that woodland. Um, and so it's a common site in parks and gardens and streets and on village greens. Um, so it's, um, it ha again, it does have lots of um, herbal actions, but anti it is an anti-inflammatory and particularly an anti-inflammatory for veins, which is why you'll see it in a lot of varicose vein creams, which is what I'm going to put a little recipe on there. So another way to use horse chestnut, um, the seed, is to use it in the same way that you would use soap nuts. So instead of buying something that comes from South America, um, you can get you can um, pick the conkers yourself and actually make it into a detergent. Um, all you do is you gather them up, you chop them up into sort of centimeter dice, and dry it. And you can just do that on a tray. Um, some people like to do it on, um, you know, sort of a, a low setting in the oven. You can, um, you can do that. It depends on how powerful your oven is, or you can just, um, just, just dry it in a warm place. Um, so then you can just store it, and it's a pretty much you just use a, um, a handful in like a bag that you then put in with your washing in your 
in your washing machine. Um, but you can look up how to use soap nuts and it's the same. You can just follow this exactly the same process. It's just you're going to be using horse chestnut seeds. Uh, so that's a fun one to, uh, to have a go with. Um, so varicose vein cream. This is what I would recommend is to have 10 ml of your horse chestnut tincture. So for people who don't know what a tincture is, it's where um, a part of a medicinal plant has been soaked in alcohol and, um, and then you can use that. So this is to be used externally only, remember, external only. You then add it to a cream um, and then you could use that for varicose veins. I mean, there's lots of things that you could use with it, but that's just a fun, um, easy one that people can, can make straight off with things that probably you've got in the cupboard. Um, you know, you could use vodka, you could use brandy. You pretty much could use any of that type of alcohol that you have um, in the cupboard that would work. Um, and you can also use any cream as a base cream. So any white, thick white cream that you might have in your medicine cupboard, um, you can use as a base cream. And I have got a video about how to do that and that's linked in there. So you don't need to worry about how to do that. I've got a video on how to do it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's a, that's a great one to have a, have a play with. The old horse chestnut. Um, Okay, so willow, much more well known, I think, probably as um, as a medicinal tree, and it's the leaves and the bark um, that tend to be used medicinally, and there are lots of different willow species that can be used medicinally. Um, some of them have more medicinal properties than others, so there's there's quite um, a range in the different species but a lot of them can be used interchangeably. Um, and that's a massive topic and not one that I'm gonna be talking about today, but I have a link at the end of the presentation to Holtwood Herbs and um, Anne Stobart is an expert on willow and she has some lovely things on her website about the different willows and how you use them. So I recommend to have a look at that if that's what you want to look into. So they are found growing in wet ground such as rivers and stream sides um, and the actions that I'm focusing on today are anti-inflammatory analgesic which means pain relieving and astringent which means to draw in tissues. So this one is not one I recommend taking if anybody's taken any medication. It is also not suitable for anybody who is pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, it's, um, you could, but you could use it externally, that would be fine. Um, and I'll just, so willow, I mean, people think of willow being um, the base of, or how aspirin was developed, um, which is true. There were a few different medicinal plants that were used in the development of the drug aspirin, but willow doesn't have the same biochemistry that aspirin has. So you don't have the issues with, um, the side effects that you have with aspirin in the in um, willow because it's not the same, um, so you don't need to um, to worry in that sense. Okay, so willow. This is a really great remedy to have in your herbal home first aid kit, and it's an easy one that you can make at any time of the year, pretty much. Um, I mean, obviously, as long as the leaves are are out. Um, so make, you can make a hot infused oil um, and I've got a video about how you can do that if you don't know how to make an infused oil um, with willow leaves, um, whatever willow you happen to have um, and then you can make it into an ointment and then you can keep that to be used on any kinds of bumps and bruises. Um, you could use it on scratches, you could use it if you you know, twisted your ankle, lots of different uses. So it's a really great one and it's a fun one to have a go with um, in the kitchen. Um, so yeah, and you can use any oil that you have in the kitchen. Any vegetable oil will work. If you want to try it in coconut oil, you can. Um, just, you need, just need to make sure that the, the temperature doesn't go too high. That's the only trouble with um, using coconut oil. Um, but 
I do mention that in one of my other videos. Uh, so yeah, so that's a great one to have a go with the Herbal First Aid Kit. Ginkgo. Again, one that lots of people have heard of, maybe even taken. Um, a lot of people take this as a supplement um, and obviously in other forms as well, like tinctures and teas and that type of thing. So Ginkgo biloba, that's its Latin name, um, and it's the leaves that are used medicinally. The seeds are poisonous, as I mentioned before. It's originally from China, but popular in parks and gardens in the UK. You will find it about the place. People will have it in their garden and you'll see the leaves because there's one just down the road from me. And you know, on a windy day, all the leaves are up the road and it's definitely a ginkgo. There's, it's, there's no mistaking it. It is um, just itself. <laughs> so uh, you may well find it in a local park um, or garden, or it, you know, if you fancy growing one in your own garden, then you know, you can. Um, so herbal actions, there are a lot. I mean, there are books and books and books written about ginkgo. It is um, uh, a very famous and very well researched uh, medicinal tree. And I could go on for years talking about it. But just to summarize, it's anti-allergenic, it's anti-inflammatory and a circulatory tonic. Um, not one to be taken um, in pregnancy, breastfeeding, or if you're taking any medications. Um, so, yeah. It's, I mean, a lot of people know it for its use in memory, I think. And there's certainly a lot of research in, can it be used in Alzheimer's? Um, is it, you know, they, they did want to try it, see if they could make a, basically an Alzheimer drug from ginkgo, which is why there's so much research on it and how it affects the brain. Um, so yeah, there's lots of research out there on that, but it's, I mean, it's got, it's got hundreds and hundreds of uses. So I'm really just briefly touching on it now, um, just for something for you to look out for. Maybe there's some near you and you might want to have a go with it. Um, or maybe you want to buy it and, um, have a go with it as a tea, you know, maybe you want to buy it dried and, uh, and try it as a tea, um, which is the recipe that I've got in here. Um, just as a general tonic really um, and to improve memory uh, yeah so you, if you if it's not contraindicated with you then you can try it as a tea it doesn't taste horrible for people who are trying it for the first time um, so yeah again lots of uses but I wanted to include it because it's one that people will often know it's often ones that you're going to see on a uh, shelf in a supermarket uh, in that usually as a supplement form but it is something that you may well you may well see okay so these are the resources that i talked about so some books for people who are people who like to <laughs> have a book tree medicine by peter conway is by far my probably my favorite um which looks like hang on i will need to switch out of it to show you a picture um and the medicinal forest garden handbook by anne stobart that's a new one that's just come out this year that one's a bit more advanced um and so maybe if you're a bit more of a beginner i would recommend the first one um if you're a bit further into herbal stuff then then certainly the medicinal forest garden handbook by anne Stobot is very good. Um, the A to Z of British Trees by the Woodland Trust is just a really nice, easy introduction. They've got some traditional uses on there, which is quite interesting. And also all about ID and how you can identify the different trees and what trees you might find. Um, now, also, this is Holtwood um, Herbs, which is run by Anne. So that's Anne Stobart who wrote the book. And she has some really, really great medicinal tree information sheets, which you can download for free on her website um, if you want to really go into more depth, um, not just about the ones that I've mentioned, but just generally. So really, some really, really great resources there. And that's also where she's got the, the information about the different willows and how you can use them. Um, so I highly recommend those. Obviously there are other sources of information out there, but these are the ones that I particularly like. Okay. I'm just going to pop us back a second. Okay. 
right i'll just show you the uh, so this so this is tree medicine this is what it looks like it's not expensive um i mean this is a few years old now i'm trying to think how when it was published this one. Oh, two thousand and one. So yeah, it's a it's it's a fair age really now, um, and it's still it's still great. I mean, some things maybe are not quite as up to date, obviously, because it's twenty years old. But it's great, and it's just it's got quite abbreviated information, but it's got lots of different trees. So if you are if you've got one maybe in the garden and you think, oh, I wonder if that's medicinal, or you know, you just want um, sort of more of a um, an encyclopedia of tree, medicinal trees then this one is really great it's so inexpensive i mean i think i paid i certainly didn't pay any more than 10 pounds for it second hand um and this is the other one that i mentioned which is the new one which is the medicinal forest garden by Anne stobart so this one is a bit more expensive but if you're really into your medicinal trees it is a great one to have um Right, let me, I will just unmute you. I don't think anybody's got any questions, but there's not too many of us, so we should be okay if we mute. So you're welcome to unmute if you have any questions. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself, but if you, anybody has any trouble, then just wave their hand. <laughs> I'll try and un, un, unmute you. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Was that a bit too fast? I was conscious of the, sp of the speed, but, but I was going. I've got a little question, if I may, about, sorry, Rina, a little question about um, the willow leaves. You said you can pick them any time of the year. Is yeah. there a time when they're more potent or more useful? Sorry, I'm just turning my volume up. Um, I, th I would say with most things, as they're going into um, their full spring growth, I would say that's when something would be more potent. Um, sometimes you want something to be a little bit later on because you want it to have developed more. And that's usually when something is flowered and you're wanting the properties from that as well. Um, but in the case of a leaf um, rather than a flower, then I would say, um, yeah, quite sort of spring, end of spring, early summer would 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 be the time that would be fine but actually there's there would be no reason you know if you think oh actually you know is it too late now it would be fine to um to get it a bit later it's just you just be aware that it is probably going to be slightly um reduced in its medicinal properties that's all yeah thank you um, how hot or is the oil, do you just heat it to warm temperature? You don't have it that it comes to boiling. No, no, it's it's more, um, I know, hot is kind of like a, it, yeah. it's a misnomer in the fact that it's not actually that hot. So you would do it in a like a bain-marie um, to protect the herb, otherwise the heat is going to be too much. The oil will heat up too quickly and you'll just end up basically with fried... <laughs> leaves which you know i we've all done um <laughs> accidentally uh so yeah a bain marie is is the best way and then just chop up your leaf pop it in in the oil in the top of the bain marie and then just have it on um i mean with a tough the, the thing is with the leaf that is quite tough you do actually need maybe a slightly hotter temperature than you would need for mm -hmm. it we were, we were using lemon balm or something that you know is that much um it would disintegrate at the higher temperatures whereas this a willow leaf is quite tough so you're going to need to actually have a little bit of a higher temperature than you would with um other things so it is fine to go a little bit higher um but certainly you should be able to stick your finger in it okay it shouldn't be that's that's a really technical <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, 
you know it if it's too hot. But, but yeah, it's, you, it's it's not that you want to. It shouldn't it shouldn't burn you. Um, that's too hot. That's too hot. You, so you okay. want it to be a bit hotter than you would normally do it for sort of you know flowery things, but not so hot that you can't put your hand in it. All right, and and, and I suppose once it reaches that temperature, you take it off. Then you don't. So you need, so once, say, um, you know, you've, re you've got to the point of the temperature you want, I would set the hob to low or whatever you're, you know, you're using. Um, if you're doing it, it, you can do it actually in a water bath in a slow cooker if you want to do it overnight. Um, um, you can, in a, in a jar, um, and then you just fill the water up for people who are slow cooker users. Yeah. Um, but other than that, if you're doing it on the, on the hob, then yes, um, it, it's still, it's going to take a couple of hours. So it's, it's not a quick, it's not a quick thing. It, you know, hot infusion is seen to be like a quick method and it is a quick method in comparison to a month <laughs> of waiting if you're going to do it cold but mm -hmm. it is going to still going to take a couple of hours really um for for a willow leaf to properly infuse certainly two at yeah, least so you once you've brought it to the temperature that you think is okay you then set it aside yeah with the leaves yeah okay yeah That's lovely. yeah yeah but it, it so it needs to be in the oil the warm oil yeah. for at least two hours certainly yeah Okay, say. and is olive oil all right to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely fine. I use olive oil quite often um, okay. because um, I'm allergic to nuts, so there are certain oils that I can't mm -hmm. have, and so I use olive oil a lot. And yes, it's absolutely fine to use to use for that. Um, sunflower is also fine, um, but really, mm -hmm. to be honest, anything that you happen to have in the house is fine. Yeah. That was <laughs> I wouldn't be thinking, oh, you know, you must go out and buy such and such for it you don't you don't need to whatever you have is fine yeah okay thank you very much can i just quickly ask what the um oh, reason okay. is for making um an ointment after you have your infused oil could you use the infused oil as it is i've yeah. never had much luck with ointment yeah yeah you could you could there's no reason why you couldn't the only reason is if you it's more stable in its ointment form so if you're going to have it in a first aid kit and it may be getting hot and cold hot and cold hot and cold all the time if you do that to an infused oil it's going to mold whereas if you do that to an ointment it's um stable enough to not go moldy for that much longer so it's completely to do with more to do with convenience than efficacy it, it still would be comp if you just wanted to keep it in the cupboard in the house and it wasn't going to be used sort of out and about anywhere and the temperature wasn't going to be changing then an, the infused oil itself would be absolutely fine um it, it's not going to go more you know i mean it's probably going to last six months to a year um, um, without there being any mould issues. Um, so the only reason about the ointment is just stability. That's, that's all. Yeah. And obviously uh, some people don't like, um, it's slightly less greasy if you use um, an ointment in comparison to an infused oil. And so some people just prefer to, to have something slightly less greasy. Um, if you're into, you know, if you're into your cream making, you can just make it into a cream instead if that's you know if that's what you want but some people don't like even an ointment you know um so so yeah so you could you could use it in a cream too okay yeah can i just ask what made you choose um i'm just intrigued laura what made you choose those four trees I suppose I wanted things that some that were was obviously the elder is out now oh, so yeah. that's really easy for people to be able to identify horse chestnut I think a lot of people feel comfortable identifying so it's a safe easy one for people to get started with ginkgo mm -hmm. is one of those ones that is well known to be medicinal but people tend to be a bit like um I suppose they're not really connected with it as a tree um, they are happy to see it in a little tablet bowl, but maybe not as a tree. And um, so, so yes, yeah, so I wanted something that people could understand easily because it is quite, um, I mean, the number of medicinal trees in the UK, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't, 
to hazard a guess, I would say it was certainly into the hundreds. Mm. Um, so it's a really massive topic. And so I really wanted to just start off on, in an easy way for people to get into it before I went into something a bit more complex because, um, it, yeah, there are, there are lots of amazing medicinal trees out there. Yeah. Thank you. Could you say again what you said about bark? Because I'm wondering if, you know, can you still use bark? And like, how do you do that? How do you take the bark off? Yeah, so in the majority of cases, it's the inner bark that's used. So if you have, if we cut a cross section of a branch now, we would have the outer like that. And then you would have the inner bark, which is, um, the bit that sort of is the, ne the next the next layer down, if you like. So that outer yeah, bit yeah. just comes off. Then sometimes there's a sort of um, like a papery layer, which you have to scrape off as well. And it's the bit underneath that bit, which is the inner bark, which is the bit that's medicinal. So that's what you would use in for um, the cramp bark um, and also, um, cher you know, cherry bark for people who use that for coughs. Um, exactly the same same way. It's the it's the inner bark. It's not the outer bit. Take that bit off, so and then it's, it's scraped off on the inside. Yeah, so it's not massively easy to forage. You can't just kind of start hacking away at the tree. It, <laughs> yeah, it's not the easiest thing to do, and obviously you need to do it appropriately and safely. Um, yeah. So you would you wouldn't be taking massive branches. You can take smaller branches and you would be taking from several trees. Um, you would only be taking a very small amount from any tree. Mm. Um, so yeah, so it's the inner bark. Ne nearly always it's the inner bark. Occasionally there are a few trees where it's the outer, but it, nearly always it's the inner bark. When you see it written in a book or anything about, oh, it's the bark of this tree that's used medicinally. That's what they mean, inner bark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So cinnamon, if you ever see a roll of cinnamon, that's a classic one that people have in their cupboards because that's the inner bark of the cinnamon tree that's just uh -huh. been dried. At, well, they roll it and then they dry it. Um, so, so that is actually um, the inner bark of the cinnamon tree. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> lots of people have that one. Okay. Um, well, I will put this, this will be available online. So um, you'll be able to, um, a link will go out via email tomorrow. Um, and then you can just download it. So you can just save it if you want to listen to it again, or have the links in the presentation and everything. That will come out to you. Um, and I, I may well do another one, um, because it has been really popular. And um, if people want to learn more and you know go into more depth then it's something that I'm I might might look at because it's that's the difficulty is it's it's a it's such a massive subject um, and um, because that's I was going to teach um, I was due actually to be teaching um, a workshop on it mm. at this time um, in a woodland um, and so it would have been a very different um, thing that I would have been teaching obviously because the trees would be there uh and i would be going into a lot more depth in connecting with trees and all that kind of stuff so it it's just putting it into webinars i might do sort of bite-sized bits about different things um yeah so we'll, we'll see <laughs> if people want if people want that then i then i i'm i'm, mm. I'm going to do it sounds great yeah it does I will, um, I will see. <laughs> um, because I, I mean, I'm not going to be doing that workshop until next year. And even then, I mean, I don't, at the moment, I don't know um, when. Well, or, we do, just don't know, do we, really? All that, all that kind of stuff, I don't know. I mean, it's easy easy to socially distance outside, outside and, we're, you know, we're outside. So um, I, th I think it will be possible, but I probably just will need to change the way that I do some of the things but that's hopefully it'll be next next year and um i'll be able to do it in um in the woodland in worcester near worcester um worcester. 
which why is, Worcester, Laura? Um, it's just because that's um, I I know the woodland there, and I and I know Trevor who owns it, and I've run workshops there before with him. Um, not with him, but you know, <laughs> using using that woodland, and um, it's just a really lovely space, and it's one that I know that I can do everything outside that I want to in the appropriate place and it's great the fact that he actually owns it which means that you can do that much more than you would be able to do mm -hmm. in a space that is owned by someone else like if I wanted to do it in, like in a botanical garden or something it would be lovely mm -hmm. but you know obviously there I wouldn't be able to just chop a bit off and give it to you <laughs> whereas mm -hmm. I could do that um if I'm if I'm uh, if I'm there so yeah it it's just it's just that much easier for me um and yeah so i've 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 taught there several times uh, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah hopefully hopefully and and would they be day workshops day yes long? yeah i mean yeah, not not weekend just a day yeah no not um i think like your herb one. i think yeah i think i would just do it as as a day to begin with because mm -hmm. it's it's something that I have taught on other courses, but I've never taught it in that way. So I'm, I'm teaching it in a, in a slightly different way, um, being it much more specific towards medicinal trees, whereas normally I sort of do a mixture. Um, mm. and, uh, so yes, I think I'm just gonna do it as a one day workshop um, and then sort of it I may well do a follow you know I may well end up doing a follow on one from that if people really liked it that you know that go on that day then I might do follow up ones so it's sort of a bit of trial and see how it how it goes really. You'll have to entice us with little ones like this in the okay. meantime. <laughs> <laughs> okay I will I will I'll I may well do ones about my because these ones are ones that I thought you know people would know and would be interested about but the ones that are my favorites are the ones that are a little bit more unusual um so mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I may do I may be do one that is my, my fate my favorite my favorite um medicinal tree which, which is your favorite well that would be telling that would oh, be oh come on you've got to be, you've got to be I mean, that's, that's like you know asking a herbalist what their favorite plant or tree is i mean it changes it changes all the, all the time really but but yeah no i certainly i certainly have some some favorites yeah <laughs> Okay. Is there any is there any place you can get like a herbalist year, you know, sort of um, a calendar of what's in flower, what you know, what you could be using, what you could be looking for right now? Um, yes. Um, I think sounds a nice thing to put together. I think there's certainly a calendar that they um what are they called i can picture it can't can't think of what it's called um i know there have been ones but the trouble is what what often you you find is that there are ones that are medicinal and then there are ones that are foraging and you tend not to get the ones that are the two together um, so you sometimes will see, I'll, I'll see ones that are sort of, you know, foraging year and all those types of things, but they don't have the medicinal properties on. And then you've got other ones that are just the medicinal without the other, other stuff. So, so yeah, it can be difficult okay. to find the two. To so there's get. a gap in the market. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I I have seen things, but I'm like, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure who, who sells it or if it's, or if it's even available now, things that that maybe have gone out of print. So the, the a place that you could try or that would know is the Herb Society. So they have a magazine, um, and I I I don't know whether they you know like sometimes in magazines they have like a um, like a bookshop type thing. I don't know whether they do it. They would do it as part of that. Um, that's the only that's the only one that I could think of. Um, I can think of ones that don't make them anymore, but um, yeah, I'll have to have a think. But certainly, the Herb Society would be a place to try. Okay, thank. Hi, Laura. Just listening Hi. to you talking about that, 
Um, Herbalist Without Borders do a really that's good. That's the one. That's good, the one. Good, Thank good you. Poster. <laughs> and, and it is available from the Herbalist Without Borders website. I think it's about sixteen pounds, but it's a long, um, kind of thin. Very, it feels very reminiscent of school photos, whole school photos. It's that kind of long, thin. Roll it up and stick it in a in a uh, the inner of a, a toilet roll to keep it safe poster rather than a, a big standard poster but that's really good because it takes you through the herbal year both things that you can find wild and also things you might have in your garden yeah there we go that was what i was trying to remember i could picture it in my mind that that their old one had like a black cover <laughs> yeah this, this is a white fold up yeah. roll out poster and it but it's really useful yeah Definitely. That That's was great. great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, in that case, I think I'll end it here um, and do look out for the email that will come out tomorrow and you'll have access to everything um, on there. Okay. Right. Thank you, Thank you very much. Love that. Thank you very much. Let's see another one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you.